Hello everyone and welcome back to another Live at Five. I am your host, curator Kevin Adkison, coming to you from the Cranbrook Institute of Science and the subject of today's Live at Five, our long-awaited tour of the Thomas Alva Edison House. Now, many of you have requested a beautiful but windy spring day, so I hope that you can hear me. Our tour is going to focus on Edison House, um, and we'll go throughout the entire home. It's recently been brought back online and has had a number of um, life safety and uh, uh, equipment upgrades. And I'll talk a little bit more about why and how we're using Edison House once we get inside. So just to locate us, if you're familiar with the Cranbrook Institute of Science, uh, of course, I'm sure you've come here as a kid or brought your children or grandchildren here. Uh, this is the building that was designed by the late great Aliel Saarinen and opened in May of 1938. There's, of course, the addition from 1998 by the architect Stephen Hole. And since about 2006, uh, the Cranbrook parking structure is right here. And so Edison House is really nestled within the sub-campus of the Institute of Science. It's kind of amazing that for Cranbrook to be considered the cradle of mid-century modernism, uh, the Edison House is our only example of mid-century modern architecture on campus. And so while Aliel Sarnin and the faculty of Cranbrook Academy of Art educated a generation of young artists, architects, and designers like Florence Knoll and Harry Bertoia, uh, Charles and Ray Eames, uh, Ralph Rapson, uh, Harry Weiss, while they were educated here, we don't actually have examples of their work on the campus. And of course, most of the campus is designed by Aliel Sarnin. I think that's what makes Edison House so interesting to me, is that it is the sort of uh, fruit of the labor of the 1930s and early 40s artists and designers of Cranbrook, because by the time this house opens in 1966, sort of mid-century modernism, the ranch house has complete victory over the American suburb. And so a lot of the innovations that we see here at Edison House aren't necessarily unique to Edison House. Um, in fact, I'd be hard pressed as a historian to find anything about Edison House that is really uh, at the cutting edge of design. Instead, it reflects something different. It reflects, I think, the total victory of modernism in the imagination of the American home. The architect of this small house is an architect that it's a little bit hard to uh, learn a ton about, in part because his name is William P. Smith, uh, and that is a pretty difficult Google search. Um, I do know that in the 1920s, William P. Smith was a contractor working out of Pontiac, Michigan. He was actually uh, commissioned to do some of the work on the first Cranbrook building. So William P. Smith is listed in the archives as a supplier and contractor for uh, some of the work on the Booth and Swanson Designed Academy Administration Building, the first buildings for the Academy of Art. William Smith would go on to become an in-house architect for the Detroit Edison Electric Company. And of course, the Edison All-Electric House, it might tell you why we have this architect who was, to the best of my research, designing electrical substations as his daily job, uh, here designing a house at Cranbrook. I think perhaps if it had been a project led not by the Institute of Science, but by the Academy, it would have been an Academy architect. But instead, we have, I think, William P. Smith's greatest work of architecture here, the Thomas Alva Edison House. It was the vision of the longtime Institute of Science director, Dr. Robert Hatt. Hatt came to Cranbrook in 1935. He retired in 1967, a year after the house was built. And this was his last major project. The house was built to serve as a visiting distinguished scholars residence. The first distinguished visiting scholar was uh, Dr. Carl Sachs, the noted botanist and geneticist who lived here with his wife for two, uh, uh, one or two years. 
The last resident of the Edison House was uh, Daniel E. Applebaum, who was a mineralogist and the uh, director of the Institute of Science who built the 1998 edition. So he lived here with his family. For the past 20 years since uh, Applebaum left, it was used for offices, it was used for events, it was used for IT, and then it was used for storage. So I'm excited to show you that it's being brought back to life, uh, even if the exact purpose is a little bit unclear right now. Now that we know some of the history of the Edison Electric House, let's look at some of the features. Now, it is a collaboration between Dr. Hatt and the Institute of Science, who needed housing for distinguished visiting scholars and the Edison Electric Company, who wanted to demonstrate uh, and use this project as a show home. And so everything about the house is electric, starting with the um, standing seam copper roof, which was uh, donated by the Anaconda Wire uh, and Copper Company, the same company that did the roof at Kingswood 30 years before this. Unlike the Kingswood roof, this copper roof is electrified, and so it had originally a sensor that could detect when snow was beginning to accumulate on the roof and then the roof automatically would heat up and melt the snow. Now down below that we see redwood, the painted redwood, but the entire exterior of the house is made out of redwood paneling and then Indiana limestone and extruded brick from Missouri. And all of these materials were either uh, donated in part or in whole by the manufacturers. And so I'll add a link to the comment section, but the entire dedicatory book that tells you every single company uh, and what they donated uh, is part of Cranbrook Archives. Now, these uh, extruded bricks were advertised as reflecting the best of America's colonial heritage. I think if you compare our extruded mechanical uh, bricks here to Aelial Sarnen's more handmade bricks, you'll see that it still looks like a mechanically produced brick. Um, but these are called rose mold bricks, and they're from uh, uh, Missouri, and then brought here to give us this sort of very organic, one with nature design. Now, I stepped down to get out of the wind, but you will notice the Edison House is a full half level below the street, so the entire house is nestled down in the hillside. There are all sorts of wonderful electric lights out here, including my favorites, these strange little mushroom-like lights. Um, and these were again donated by the manufacturer, the Shalda Garden Light Company. Now, as we turn to the house, we see that it does go down a whole level. And so it's nestled in the hillside and there's some wonderful cut photograph collages in the archives showing how they plan to clear some of the site in order to build Edison House. So just like many suburban homes, it is a uh, appears as a one-story house on the front and then two stories once you get into the garden. Now the landscape has been cleared but obviously it has not been restored. Um, the original landscape design was by Eichstätt and Grissom Landscape Company which Albert Eichstätt, you may know that name if you've been following along with wrapped attention to Live at Five, uh, Mr. Eichstätt was the designer of Jonah Pools and the landscape architect of Kingswood School. So it was his firm that designed the landscape here at Edison House. It was built on a site of Pin Oaks Beach and Crab Apples, and then they surrounded the house originally with native Michigan plants that were planted for all season interest, and also to help uh, all of these glass windows look out and sort of see a manicured landscape into the naturalistic wooden landscape. Of course, much of that has sadly been lost. Now, the driveway down to the house leads us to a full garage, which had a radio, or an early radio remote control garage opener to an electric garage uh, motor. And we're standing on old electric heating coils to keep the driveway from having to be plowed. Here we see a wonderful 
uh, funny little total electric award. Um, this is the gold medallion home from the uh, sort of trade group that oversaw all electric houses. And so I think this is wonderful that we still have it here on the concrete. As we were re-pouring all of this, I talked to our contractor and I said, if you have to change that sidewalk, you and I are figuring out how to get my total electric award plaque out of there. That's quite possibly why we didn't repair that sidewalk. So once you've sort of seen the house from the outside, next we'll head inside. And of course, if you have questions, you can type them into the chat feature. Now, out here we see the door, and it does have its original new tone doorbell. Uh, it doesn't work anymore, it's the speaker box is missing, but we start our uh, home with no chores, as the Detroit Free Press called it. Uh, and it, we are going to see endless sort of 1966 innovations throughout the house. Now, if you tried watching my last tour of Edison House, uh, there was not Wi-Fi here. There now is, so we should have a clear connection for the rest of our tour. And you step inside and you immediately are uh, standing in this wonderful sort of height and a half vaulted ceiling where now you can stand and you can look out through these walls of glass out into the landscape. Now, these windows, which were donated by Anderson Window and Doors, uh, are some of the earliest examples of having flash-plated metal uh, coatings on the window that provided both heat resistance, um, but then it was also electrified. So there were electrical currents that run through the glass to keep these from fogging up in the winter. I kind of doubt that still works, um, but it is an early example of this uh, really remarkable uh, uh, technology of, of essentially completely transparent electrical coating on the inside of a sheet of glass. You had two little electrical connections and you can completely defrost your window. Now, in this room originally would have been furnishings donated by Knoll Associates. Uh, of course, Florence Knoll was a graduate of Kingswood and the Academy of Art. As Richard has noted, uh, there is no furniture here except for these little beds. And uh, the house was generously brought back online uh, through the work of Cranbrook Facilities and also through a grant from the DTE Energy Foundation. So the, the same Detroit Edison company that built this in 1966 last summer helped us to rehab the house as a way of dividing the campus. So uh, at first there was an idea that fourth grade would be taught here. Uh, in the end, there was enough space at the Institute of Science main building to not have to use this as classrooms. And so you'll see that it is prepped for um, not necessarily quarantine space, but additional dormitory space for students if they needed to, if they had traveled or if they needed uh, more beds that were not in the school's dormitories. Luckily, our COVID precautions have really paid off. We have not had to use Edison House for that purpose. So you're going to see the beds throughout, uh, but to my knowledge, the students never needed this space. So I'm excited to see as time goes on, now that Edison House has really been cleaned up many of the issues of sort of mold and mildew and outdated electrical systems. I'm excited to see what happens next. And on behalf of all of Cranbrook, I want to thank the DTE Energy Foundation for this, their support. Now, in this room, we're seeing that redwood that I mentioned on the outside. And so the whole house uh, from the American Redwood Company in Washington uh, is built out of solid heartwood redwood beams, or like the cross beam here, a laminated redwood beam. And redwood is a great tree to build with because it is naturally rot, mold, mildew resistant. And so the redwood on the interior of the house is unfinished. At some point, the exterior redwood was painted and it remains painted, uh, but it didn't have to be. It, it could have been a more of a Frank Lloyd Wright aesthetic with all exposed and quite beautiful redwood. This row of bookshelves here 
uh, held uh, some of the library for the visiting scholars. And then there is this built-in fireplace here, and we'll see that it's a two-story fireplace. The material used for the floor is from the Delaware Tile Company in Delaware, Ohio. And these are handmade hexagonal tiles that are really just exquisitely beautiful and so warm. Now, from the uh, Delaware Tile Company, we move to uh, more redwood slats. And these lead up to little, what are called in the pamphlet, bullet night lights. And these are bronze tinted uh, uh, lights that shine down through the redwood baffles and are meant to be kept on as the sort of subtle evening illumination in the house. Behind the baffles is the stairway down to the garden level. Uh, there was originally a quite beautiful portrait of Thomas Edison here that I'm a little curious as to where it went off to. It was an oil portrait. Um, it's probably in someone's office at the Institute. If you're watching, let me know. Uh, and all of this um, walnut paneling was donated by the U.S. Plywood Corporation. And the U.S. Plywood Corporation was celebrating its um, 60th anniversary in 1966. And so they donated um, Michigan and exotic plywoods to the house. So throughout the house, there was pecan plywood, cherry plywood, persimmon plywood, birch plywood, and walnut plywood. And those of you who came on my plywood talk a few weeks ago know you can do anything with plywood, including lots of uh, wall paneling. And part of this was that Dr. Hatt wanted the entire house to be a teaching tool. And so he thought by using these many different species of trees as plywood, you could almost use it like a uh, museum display and sort of learn about your different wood grains and wood qualities through the actual construction details of the house. Now, it is essentially a two-family home, uh, though to my knowledge, I, I don't think it was ever used uh, in the way it was designed with an upstairs and a downstairs. So we'll look first at the visiting scholars half of the home, they would have had that main uh, living room. And then this was the design to be the office for the visiting scholar. And so there were about uh, eight visiting scholars who used the house in the 60s and 70s uh, before it shifted to employee housing. And this office, again, has the, the pitched ceiling, uh, very clear construction. You can understand the redwood going up to the center beam and then supporting the copper roof above. Another example of a different uh, Amer U.S. Plywood Corporation donation on the paneling. And then these really beautiful bookshelves uh, that I was pleased to see have come through the generations of Edison House use quite remarkably unscathed. In this room, we also have lighting, and lighting throughout the house was donated from a number of different American companies. Um, these lights are very much reflective of the sort of Alvar Alto aesthetic of lighting design. So these are not Alvar Alto hanging fixtures, but they're very similar. They're the sort of mass market version of that famed Finnish designer. Now, behind the desk of the visiting scholar is the heart of the home. And this is our state-of-the-art 1966 new tone transistor stereophonic speaker system. And so from here, I can radio intercom the living room, uh, the study. I can go all the way to di the different bedrooms, the garages, and I can either listen or I can put it on the radio intercom. And if I put it on listen, I could select my AM or FM radio, but then I could also select, and I don't know which button it is, I can switch to speakers or to microphones that were wired to the trees out back so that you could sit in your glass tree house with no windows open and hear the sounds of nature beyond. And there's a wonderful press photo of the lady of the house with her binoculars looking through the closed window, listening to the bird songs and seeing them out in the woods. Now, below the new tone system and connected to it was the original uh, uh, quite elaborate 
combination dictaphone, um, telephone, intercom, and record player, this big hunk of machinery uh, that tilted out. And part of this, you know, who knows how much it was used by the visitors, but when the house opened, uh, part of the donation from the Detroit Edison Company uh, was that for uh, May, June, July, before the Dr. Sachs moved in, the house was open for tours. And so in archives, we have all the color-coded tickets of the many thousands of people who came through the house as guests of Detroit Edison. And so all of these companies had little paper signs on everything that they donated. And so you could come and you could really see this almost like a World's Fair show house, and it could demonstrate all of the possibilities of modern electric living. Now, in our first bathroom here, which has the automatic vent, so it's a little loud, but I want to show us the sink um, and this beautiful uh, piece of marble that was uh, donated and restored uh, recently. New fixtures here, but the original sink, and I love this sort of colonial revival aesthetic of the sink. Uh, this is from the American Olean Company, uh, which did all the bath tiles. And then Crane, uh, the sink might be Crane, but it, it was a number of different companies that donated these pieces. It's the sort of thing where it's like, you absolutely see this in the catalog, in the ad, in the show home, but I'm always curious as to how many people outside of the Hollywood Hills would have been investing in that particular sink form. Here we see a donated daylight light. And so this was designed for uh, getting ready before the sun had rised or before the winter was there. So it's a heat lamp and daylight light that was donated. And then the vanity here with its original, uh, a new marble donation. And then the wonderful original built-in cabinets with their mid-century modern uh, poles. The master bathroom through here, uh, which has more examples of the American Orleans tiles. Uh, 1966, we are a far cry from those wonderful Powabic bathrooms of Thornley, uh, but still interesting to have the little decorative elements. I quite love these medicine cabinets uh, with the beautiful wooden interior. Now, the master bedroom is you know, scaled to a, a 60s split-level house, so a uh, cozy room here. It's substantially bigger than any room in my house, uh, and we can see the, the new tone system, the intercom there, as well as some additional, uh, uh, the doorbell system, which you could train your doorbell, or you could have your doorbell have different um, uh, sounds coming out. Now I want to pause here for one of my favorite features, which is the General Electric uh, Remote Control System. It was called the GE Remote Control Wiring System. And what you have here are the on and off switches. And so if you want to turn on a room, you, if you want to say turn on the sixth, the master bedroom, you get the number six, you select it here and you push it. Then when you want to turn it off, you go to six over here and you push it and it should go off. Now, if you want to turn off all of the lights, you can just turn them like this and like this, and we should have shut the whole house off. So it's remote as in I can control the whole house from these panels, uh, but not remote controlled. And then we can turn them all back on for our tour. And I did notice that I'm knocking off the stickers on camera. Well, the house is old. I will reattach those. Now, as we come through, uh, if you had been standing in the house, you would have seen them go on and off. I'm going to end the tour with the kitchen. So we'll head downstairs first, past the memory of our portrait of Thomas Edison. And when the house was dedicated in June of 1966, Thomas Edison's son, the former governor of New Jersey, Charles Edison, was here at the dedication. And so he sort of uh, oversaw the christening of the, the building. Now, down here in the lower level, we have again a corner of glass. As part of the restoration, the original parquet floor, which was hiding some 
uh, moisture damage had to be removed. And so this is a, a new wood floor down here, but we were also able to uncover uh, what had been plasterboarded over all of the original brick wall finishing and then remediated some of the water issues from the outside. There's another uh, chimney or our fireplace and wood store down here, this great mid-century modern uh, uh, fireplace with stone hearth. And then you can look back at the stairway coming down. What's interesting is, you know, I don't know what William Smith's relationship was with Cranbrook, uh, with the Saarinen's design, uh, but it is interesting that there is this sort of vertical baffle along the stairs, because that is a detail that Aliel Saarinen does throughout uh, campus. And I don't know whether William Smith does it because it is in general a fashionable thing to do in 1966, or if it is a conscious um, sort of callback to Aliel Saarinen. Now from here, you can look out into the garden and uh, see the little pond. Now, these posts had to be added as part of the renovation. So originally, the entire porch was just one cantilever. And those redwood beams that you see sticking out, uh, were the, they, those are the main beams of the house. So those run all the way from the front garden out to the back porch. Uh, and there were no vertical columns until this summer. But also, the railing had no... Uh, the, the railing was just a single slightly rotten piece of wood. And so the, the balcony is much safer now uh, than it was earlier. In the back of the house, unfortunately, we had to uh, lose some of our wood paneling. So the hallway was wood paneled, but uh, as part of the update that was removed and the water issues remediated. Here are the little bedrooms that could have served as a additional apartment in the original idea of the house. And again, a wonderful wall of built-ins and closet doors and mid-century modern handles. And then another little office here, or, or excuse me, another bedroom here uh, that had been used as an office. And I We'll use this one as our teaching demonstration of the uh, valence system. And so the light for these rooms is all hidden behind this uh, sheet of wood. And then here you can see the original curtain rod. And the curtains were all donated by Noel. And if you have an all-electric house, you also want, you know, all the newest furnishings. And so the original drapery was all made out of um, Owens Corning fiberglass. And so you had fiberglass textiles from Knoll through Owens Corning covering all of the windows. They really look just like linen shears in the photographs, but they were fiberglass. And then down here, the for someone who saw the house before and after, the most remarkable transformation is this bathroom. Uh, new countertops, new fixtures, but the same uh, wooden cabinetry, including down here, the hamper that tilts out. There's your lovely host. Oh, and additional tiles um, from the American Orleans Company, this time with the uh, seahorses. Now, as we move back upstairs, if you have questions, let me know. Um, the carpet on these runners was added for safety, uh, to, to, especially if this was going to be used for students, um, to keep them from slipping up and down the stairs. But the carpet is not original, so they were just wonderfully floating. They're still wonderfully floating, but they were just wooden wedges, and they have this triangular design uh, that floats across the redwood uh, beam. Now, our next stop, we will look briefly at this window because I love the uh, latch mechanism from Anderson Windows and Doors as you open the piece and you can see the arms reaching out and it's running across this track here. And then as you close it again, the arms retract back in. 
this is the dining room here, and this was originally a, uh, had a very m much more modern light fixture than this uh, sort of 80s colonial revival uh, piece. So the original light fixture is missing, and then also this wall is an addition. And so in the original design, it was really sort of one flowing floor plan from the dining room into the living room here. We have arrived now at my favorite room of the house, the kitchen, which is also quite possibly one of the uh, least changed in the house. And it's certainly where the sort of ingenuity and the optimism of the post-war American house is best reflected. Now, the floor is actually from the 1980s and is a pretty significant departure from the original, but this is all of the original cabinetry. And front and center in the design is the most glorious appliance I've ever seen, um, the 1960 Frigidaire fr Flare from General Motors. And after doing some research about this oven uh, uh, two years ago, I joined a Facebook group, a Frigidaire Flare Appreciation Club. So I really now know more about this oven than I ever could possibly need to know. Um, people love this thing. It debuted at the Century of Progress, or the, uh, the 1960 A World's Fair, I forget which one, uh, as part of the Kitchen of Tomorrow from General Motors Frigidaire. And it has an interesting connection beyond just the sort of regional history, General Motors being based in Warren, Michigan, uh, in that it, the lead designer on the flare was Jane Van Austen. And Jane Van Austen, or Austin, uh, was a designer from Delaware, Ohio, the same town that gave us the floor tiles in the front uh, room. Uh, she then studied industrial art and design, and she came to Cranbrook to study in 1941. She studied ceramics here from 1941 to 1942, and then she went on to Alfred University in New York, where she again studied ceramics. She began teaching industrial design. She founded the industrial design program at Michigan State in East Lansing. Uh, and then she began working for Harvey Earle as a damsel of design at General Motors in 1955. She eventually became the head of the appliance division and she really oversaw the kitchen of tomorrow and uh, many of the sort of 1960s uh, ideal kitchens, uh, including the one that uh, was sent over to Moscow. And so Jane Van Austen is really a, quite an important figure in industrial design history. She would eventually leave appliances and she designed cars at General Motors with Harley Earl. And uh, she retired from GM in 1969. She then taught industrial design at Cornell and then she taught at the University of Montana in Bozeman until 1984 or five. We're lucky at Cranbrook uh, that she left her archives to us. And so we have a, a quite a bit, a, quite an extensive collection of hers over at Cranbrook Archives. And it's always a thrill to have a reason to go into the Jane Van Austen papers because her output was so prolific. She had eight different patents. She invented the first stackable washer and dryer, uh, but we will focus today on her legacy of the Frigidaire Flare. And so up here is the vent hood, uh, which opens up to show us the light and the vent. It does still work, and the vent is automatic. And then there are the ovens. And so you have double ovens here with these wonderful doors that uh, open and close. And I don't think ours has the rotisserie feature, but many of them uh, do. And then down here, what does not pass American design standards anymore is to have a rolling range system. And so the whole piece becomes this great sort of temple to domesticity, uh, this icon of the glorious future of the kitchen and all of it sort of in enamel on glass, the flair. It then has this wonderful series of knobs with Bakelite uh, instructions and the glass etching. And if you ever want to know how to repair a flare, uh, let me tell you, those people on the Facebook group can source any part because people who have flares 
love their flares. Now, in addition to the flare, there were all sorts of conveniences like the Swanson automatic dispenser for cellophane and aluminum foil, uh, or the Frigidaire flare. We had a matching flare dishwasher. This one's a little bit different. Then also from the New Tone company is the food center. And so here you could plug in a blender, a food processor, all types of equipment, and you would set it on there and then you can turn it on and it will uh, spin at different rates. My dad's house had one of these growing up, but just like here at Edison House, he didn't have any of the actual things that set inside. Now on the other side in our little breakfast room, there was originally here a tilt out automatic toaster. So you could flip this out and put your toast in and have it right here at the table. And you could the whole time be looking out over the Cranbrook grounds uh, and listening to the birds through your new tone speaker system because of course the kitchen has uh, uh, yet another speaker and intercom system. You could also be listening to the radio or to your records and you could check what time it was on the built-in clock. Now if the house does have a brand new refrigerator in it as well as some other updates but with the house not currently being a residence uh, the kitchen is sort of uh, uh, just a, in a holding pattern until future plans are made for Edison House. The ceiling is really beautiful with this Japanese uh, sort of aesthetic with the screen and then plastic panels. Again, all this donated by the different trade groups that wanted to participate in the uh, show home nature of the Thomas Alva Edison House. Now, I think that we have seen everything about the Edison house now. Uh, since I have been at Cranbrook, we have not had the closet doors here, but this was the sort of catering kitchen and it was covered by uh, louvered doors. Uh, and then the washer and dryer was also removed as part of our renovation. But there's a side door here uh, that takes you back out to the driveway and garage. So I think that the Edison house is a pretty cool uh, experiment in modern living. Um, we're grateful to the visionaries who brought it to us. Most importantly, Dr. Robert Hatt, who really stewarded the Institute of Science for over 30 years and really turned it into uh, an important center of scientific uh, research and uh, uh, communications. As the house has moved on, um, from its initial use as a residence for distinguished scholars. It has had so many different purposes, whether that was housing for the director of the Institute or just as offices, and then potentially as quarantine space. I look forward to now that through the DTE Foundation, where the house has been brought back online, I look forward to seeing what Cranbrook and our leadership does next with this very cool little time capsule. I also should mention Edward uh, Edwin O. George, the president of Detroit Edison at the time the house was given to Cranbrook for his really extraordinary investment in the project, as well as James Beresford, uh, who married into the Booth family and was chair of the board of the Institute of Science when this house got built. Now, if Dr. Tatt had stayed a director a little bit longer, uh, we might be looking out at Fermi House and Fermi House was going to be the world's first all-nuclear home, and it got surprisingly further into planning than you would think until there was a small nuclear meltdown on the west side of Michigan, and the idea of putting a nuclear reactor in a house on Cranbrook's campus became suddenly much less palatable. So Fermi House was never built. Before I let you go, I just want to uh, point out one other thing here in the kitchen that is not normally here. And this is a uh, beautiful vase or beautiful vessel from a current Cranbrook student. Uh, Kelly Croner produced this piece. She is a uh, uh, second year in the ceramics department and it depicts peonies, uh, white peonies on a black ground within this beautiful liquid green glaze. And why is this piece here? Well, I brought it over to be a shameless plug for our upcoming talk on Sunday, this Sunday at 3 p.m. Eastern. 
Iris Eichenberg, head of the metalsmithing department, and myself will be leading you on a tour through our new exhibition of student work in historic houses. We've called it Speculative Histories, and we have invited students across all 11 departments of the Academy of Art to produce new work for Cranbrook House, Saarinen House, and the Frank Lloyd Wright Smith House. This is a piece that was made for Saarinen House, and it looks even better in the piano on the studio where the color schemes all relate. On Sunday, I'll be delivering a slide tour through the entire show. We'll also have students who come on screen to tell us about some of their works. And it's a pretty neat opportunity for the students to get out of their studios, to get out of a white museum box, and to create art that thinks about uh, a context and thinks about the history of Cranbrook, the history of these specific houses, some of them chose to simply invent history or to present alternative histories, to dredge up lesser known stories of Cranbrook. There's about 60 artists who have produced new work and placed them in the context. Sign up for that lecture. It's going to be free uh, on uh, this Sunday at 3 p.m. Eastern. We'll see this vase in its correct context. And then I did bring over, because I thought you, my loyal Live at Five fans, would enjoy, here on the telephone desk of Edison House, we see uh, a student, Bep Diamond, Elizabeth Diamond, who has made these funny ceramic phones. And they're throughout the, the student show. And what she was envisioning was, what if the residents of these house museums were communicating with Cranbrook today? And so she used decals that show things like the Mark de Suvaru sculpture and other uh, places that weren't here on campus when the Sarnans were here or when the booths were here and imag imagined the sort of FaceTime telephone call. And so I was quite shocked when she brought in her submission and it had a picture of me doing live at five on a decal fired onto a ceramic iPhone. So if you want to see more of the students' very creative ideas, um, those are all going to be on display in our virtual opening and lecture tour this Sunday at 3 p.m. The show is called Speculative Histories and it's new work from Cranbrook Academy of Art students, faculty, and staff. It's a really great show. It's been a lot of work, a lot of fun to put together. I know we looked at some of it last week. Uh, but do go and sign up for that lecture tour. I'll be back next week on Facebook, Wednesday at 5 p.m. for another Live at 5. If you have further special requests, always send them in, and eventually we'll get there. So thanks so much for joining us on this tour of the Thomas Alva Edison House near Cranbrook Institute of Science. Until next time, everyone.